Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you uh, for this opportunity to serve you today. I pray, Lord, that uh, I would be emptied completely of self and filled with your Holy Spirit. Please lead and guide me that all that I say and do today will be bringing glory to you as you are the only one uh, deserve, who, who deserves our praise and our worship today. Please bless us all. Send us your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. Grant us your, your wisdom and understanding, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are studying the great controversy today. Can you believe it? We are coming down to the last final chapters of this most important book. And as we continue to go through these studies, we're seeing the relevance more and more clearly for our day and our time that uh, how important it is for us to be studying this book. And today, of course, is absolutely no exception. Today's study, we are going to see, while the underlying message there uh, is very concerning, there is a great amount of hope. There's a wondrous light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. And so I want us to try to, even though the, the, the theme is somewhat sad, it seems, let's focus on the positive aspect of it, the light that is at the end of the tunnel, and the glorious day that will be coming after this time of darkness. And so let's go ahead and get into this study here today. It's very, very important, and it's, it's just really awesome that we <clears throat> are so fortunate to have this information so that we know it's kind of like it's kind of like you know we can see the end from the beginning because of our prophets right that's what that's what the good news the word the bible is all about showing us what is going to happen in the end and the beautiful thing about the the book the great controversy is it just magnifies the information so that we see an even clearer picture of what's going to happen so <clears throat> a lot of intricate details here today about what is just before us i believe the time of trouble the time of trouble where does it all begin here it begins at the beginning uh, of here at the beginning of the chapter we see that we are quoting from daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 at that time shall michael stand up the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Great Controversy 613. So what does, what does Michael mean? Who is Michael? What does Michael mean? He's like God. One that is like God. And to go on a little bit further, we see in Revelation 12, 7, and, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So, again, we see that Michael is going up against a dragon. Again, we see the word dragon. And what is dragon a reference to? That's got to be Satan, right? 12.9, it, it uh, spells it out real clear, Revelation 12.9. So, but it's Michael and his angels, okay? And then the next text here I want to look at is Jude 9, Michael the archangel. It tells you a little bit more specifically who Michael is. We need to know who Michael is because there will come a time, and for me there's already been a time where people will say, well, who is Michael? There's a lot of confusion even within leaders in denominations that, that uh, they don't understand who Michael is. I was even told that Michael was um, really Gabriel. So, you know, there's some confusion there. But it's clear that Michael is the archangel. Now, what is, what is an angel? What is an angel? An angel is really just a messenger. That's what, that's what it is. But he is the archangel, which means he is the chief, right? The superior angel. When contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, 
durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. So again, Michael can uh, rebuke Satan. Michael obviously has power, a lot of power. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. So who is the archangel? It's Michael, right? Okay. And with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Let's see if we can figure out clearly from Scripture, because after all, Isaiah 28.10 says what? Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, right? That's the way we're supposed to study the Word, the Scriptures. So, the Lord Himself... He descends, and with the voice of, an arch of, the, of the archangel, he blows the trumpet, and the dead in Christ arise first. So that's going to be the second coming, right? The second coming. Now we look at John 5 and verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the who? Son of God. And who is the Son of God? Jesus, right? And they that hear shall live. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come, come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So we see clearly that this is the second coming. Well, what does it mean when he stands? Because right here, going back to the first paragraph, in the great controversy chapter uh, 39, we see at that time shall Michael stand up. What, me, what does it mean when he stands up? Well, let's look. And also I'm going to continue on here and look, and there shall be a time of trouble. So he stands up and there's a time of trouble. Well, Hebrews 1, 3, we see who being the brightest of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. And who was that? Jesus. He purged our sins. And then what did he do after he purged our sins? He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He sat down at the right hand of God the Father, right? Clearly, that's what the scripture says, okay? So what is he doing when he's setting down, when, he, when it says he sets down by the Father? He's intercessing for us, right? He's still intercessing for us. Romans 8, and we see that clearly here, Romans 8, 34, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, see, who also maketh intercession for us. So while he's on the right hand of God sitting, he's still making intercession. Okay, is that clear? But then what happened? What happened when he stood up? Do we have any biblical reference for what happened when Christ stood up? Well, we see the stoning of Stephen here in Acts chapter 7. But he, and I put Stephen in there because that's who is being referenced here, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. So what was he full of? The Holy Spirit. And he looked steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So now he has stood up. He's no longer sitting by the Father. He has now stood up and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Whenever we see God or Jesus stand up, that means that something is finished. A judgment of types is finished. And what was finished at this point? Well, Stephen's life, yes. Yes, he, he died in 34 AD. But what finished? What was, what was finished there at that time? Yeah, the Jewish nation was, it was, the message was no longer just for the Jewish nation. At that point, we see here that it went to the rest of the world. Whoops, I went the wrong direction here. 
Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. And I put Jews in there because, again, that's who's being referenced here. But seeing you put it from you, you, di you didn't want it. You pushed it away. You disregarded it. Now it's going to the Gentiles. It's going to the rest of the world, in other words. Okay? So no longer was the message basically just focused on the Jewish nation at that point it was to go and that's what we see all through the book of Acts and all through the New Testament. So what ended? The 70 week prophecy ended in 34 AD when Stephen was stoned. That's what ended. That's the prophecy that ended. So what does it mean when he stands? It means in this particular context because we're at what the end of uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel, after all these prophecies are fulfilled, we're at the end of Daniel here, and the, the judgment has finished because he has stood up. He's no longer intercessing for us anymore. And it says then, right after that, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. So right after that, we have the time of trouble. As soon as Christ stands up, there's no more forgiveness for sins. All decisions for life, for death, have been made. If you, you have either confessed your sins and your name is still written in the book of life, written in the book of life, or it's not. That's it. When the third angel's message closes, mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the earth. The people of God have accomplished their work. They have received the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord. So the latter rain comes before the time of trouble, okay? And they are prepared for the trying hour before them. Wow. That's saying a lot, to be prepared for this trying hour. But God knows we are, and we'll see just how it feels for us, though, as we go on. Angels are hastening to and fro in heaven. An angel returning from the earth announces that his work is done. The final test has been brought upon the world, and all who have proved themselves loyal to the divine precepts have received the seal of the living God. Everyone has received the seal of the living God. You've either received the seal of the living God or the seal of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, right? GC 613.2. Uh, then Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above. Right there, it's clear. Once that happens, it's over. He's no longer intercessing, intercessing for us. He's no longer uh, mediating for us. He lifts his hands and with a loud voice says, It is done. And all the angelic hosts lay off their crowns as he makes the solemn announcement, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And I just want to pause and interject something here because I hear this a lot. Oh, he or she is a good person though. They've done a lot of good things. Well, that's noble. That's certainly a good, a good attribute to have accredited to you. But you see right here, all we have to be is unjust. That's it. That's all we have to be is unjust. And he which is filthy, see, we don't have to be filthy, just unjust. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation 22, 11. Every case has been decided for life or death. Christ has made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. The number of his subjects is made up. It's complete. It's a total number. It's done. The kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is about to be given to the heirs of salvation. And Jesus is to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords, GC 613.2. I want to be accounted as that, a part of that number, amen? I want to be in that number. And I pray that each and every one of us do as well. When he leaves the sanctuary... Look at this. Darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. God, have mercy on us at that point. You mean 
Roy, you're going to tell me that we have, to, we have to walk throughout the rest of this time that we have here on earth and never sin? Yes. That's what we have to do. Because no longer will we be able to repent and receive forgiveness. But thankfully, we're sealed, we're sealed. And we are immovable at that point. We will have Christ's character and we will be unmovable. The restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed. And Satan has entire control of the finally impenitent. Now, the wicked, uh, the, the restraint against the wicked is removed. So they're locked in and praise God, I pray all of us are sealed and our fate is locked in as well. And Satan has entire control of, of this world at that point. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Let me back up. He has entire control of what God allows him at that point. God's long suffering has ended. The world has rejected his mercy, despised his love, and trampled upon his law. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. The Spirit of God, persistently resisted, has been at last withdrawn. So the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is removed from this world. I, I, I reflect again on the story of Job. How quickly when God removed his hand from protecting Job, how fast did he lose everything? Almost instantaneously. Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. There it is. As the angels of God cease to hold and check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. More terrible than that awful scene that we see in the destruction of, of Jerusalem in AD 70. GC uh, 614. A single angel destroyed all the firstborn of the Egyptians and filled the land with mourning. Remember that. One angel did all of that. When David offended against God by numbering the people, one angel caused that terrible destruction by which his sin was punished. The same destructive power exercised by holy angels when God commands will be exercised by evil angels when he permits. Mercy. Mercy. Those angels have as much power or nearly as much power to destroy as God's angels do. I mean, are we, are we getting a, a grasp of the reality of this? It's huge. There are forces now ready and only waiting the divine permission to spread desolation everywhere. Those who honor the law of God have been accused of bringing judgments upon the world and they will be regarded as the cause of the fearful convulsions of nature and the strife and bloodshed among men that are filling the earth with woe. And we've seen, we've already seen some inclinations of that. We've already seen some evidences that they are going to be and they are accusing the Christians for these things. The, the, the good, um, uh, truly um, vested men and women of God. The power attending the last warning has engaged, enraged the wicked. Their anger is kindled against all who have received the, the message, and Satan will excite to still greater intensity the spirit of hatred and persecution. When God's presence was finally withdrawn from the Jewish nation, priests and people knew it not. Isn't that interesting? You see, when the stoning of Stephen happened, then the presence of God was removed from them. They didn't even perceive it. They didn't realize it. Look at what happens. Through, though under the control of Satan and swayed by the most horrible and malignant passions, they still regarded themselves as the chosen of God, even though they did not any longer have that spirit among them, they still considered themselves the chosen of God. The ministration in the temple continued. Sacrifice was offered upon the polluted altars and daily the, the divine blessing was invoked upon a people guilty of the blood of God's dear son and seeking to slay his ministers and apostles. So what are they doing? They're looking to slay the good, right? The good uh, men working in the world, trying to uh, do a good work and sow the, the, the good seed. So when the irrevocable decision of the sanctuary 
has been pronounced and the destiny of the world has been forever fixed, the inhabitants of the earth will, not, will know it not. It's going to happen again. The same thing is going to happen again. The forms of religion will, will be continued by a people from whom the Spirit of God has been finally withdrawn and the satanic zeal with which the prince of evil will inspire them for the accomplishments of his malignant designs will bear the semblance of a zeal for God. So they'll still appear as though they have a great zeal for the Lord and be going about and trying to do his work. But the Spirit's not with them. Another Spirit is actually with them, GC 615. As the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom, and religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of the Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand, what, what size is it? It's a small minority. Now, I, I, just, I just want that to kind of sink in for a second. It's not going to be the masses of people. If you're following the masses, if you're following a large majority, please beware. Please beware. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought not to be tolerated. So what is this? Church and state. Church and state combining, right? that it is better for them to suffer than for a whole nation to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. The same argument many centuries ago was brought against Christ by the rulers of the people. It is expedient for us, said the wily Caiaphas, that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. It would be better for Christ to be killed and slain than for the rest of the nation to perish. That is going to be the same argument placed against us who stand for the truth at the end of time. Okay? If we look and reflect upon the scenes of Calvary, we can see what is going to happen at the end of time. Very similar events are going to happen at the end of time. The same anguish that we will have to go through as Christ went through in the Garden of Eden, we're going to have to go through those same type, that same type of anguish ourselves. Are we prepared for that? This argument will appear conclusive and a decree will finally be issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people liberty after a certain time to put them to death. To death, okay? Romanism in the old world and apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course toward those who honor all the divine precepts. So, a combining of church and state, the leaders of the world will combine with, with Rome, with the Protestants, and these things will be enforced. Laws will be changed. And do we see anything like that happening today? Well, as a matter of fact, just here uh, this, this past week, August the 2nd, we find that Pope Francis changes Catholic Church teaching on death penalty, declares it inadmissible, which this is really a bunch of smoke and mirrors, honestly. But still, he's claiming to be able to override the laws of the land, and I believe he has the power to do that, right? But he says the Vatican said the pontiff uh, approved a change to the catechism which gives worshipers a go-to guide for official Catholic Church teachings on subjects ranging from the sacraments to sex. Previously, the catechism said the church didn't exclude capital punishment if this is the only possible way of effecti effectively defending human lives against the unjust aggressor. So they are controlling things, in essence. We like to brush it off like, ah, oh, that's, that's just the Roman Catholicism, ah, whatever. They're not really in charge of us. But are we not seeing how closely connected our government is with Rome itself? We are. 
And what happened in history that uh, was also celebrated here just recently? July 14, Bastille Day. July the 14th. you have any idea what Bastille Day is? Anyone? Well, if we look at the great controversy in the French Revolution, um, the um, chapter on the French Revolution, uh, we will see that it begins with, in 1570, it begins with the St. Bartholomew Massacre, the most hideous of all massacres. Thousands of Protestants were slaughtered. A bell rang in the middle of the night, and, and that was, the, that was the, the clue or the, um, the tip to go ahead and start slaughtering all of these Protestants. The blood ran through the street. Thousands were killed. And then it led up <clears throat> to uh, July 14, 1789. And they had the Bastille Day. This was, this was when they are, this is a celebration in France of their going to a, a new secular society. The celebration, the worship of the goddess of reason. But going back to the... Um, that uh, St. Bar Bartholomew massacre, when the news of the massacre reached Rome, the exaltation among the clergy knew no bounds, GC 272.3. Uh, Do you see the connection there? The country of France, working in cahoots with Rome, they, did, they, they, they manifested this grand slaughter. And they actually... Uh, stamped a coin in commemoration of it. And it all comes down to a worship of the goddess of reason. That's what this Bastille Day is all about. And there's some confusion as to where it all comes down to, but ultimately, who really benefited from this revolution of the French? Who really benefited? Look at this. The flourishing of the revolution really uh, comes down to the Jesuits. Speaking of the history of France, just before the revolution, the historian Von Hulst said, the Jesuits alone flourished in the decaying nation and ruled with dreadful tyranny over churches and schools, the prisons and the galleys. Great Controversy 279. So who really flourished? The Jesuits, and, and, and re re refresh my memory, who, uh, what, what kind of uh, pope do we have right now? A Jesuit pope. So they made it appear as though, because, you, you know, in, in 1798 is when, you know, the pope was taken exiled and, and, and died in exile. Uh, the pope was taken captive. But really, that was the insurgence of the, the, uh, the Jesuit movement. They really flourished and prospered during that period of time. They took out the front man, but underneath was work, the workings of the Jesuit um, society, secret society, ultimately. And you may think, well, what does that have to do with uh, the rest of the world? That's just in France. That's no big deal, right? Well, look at this. Um, Bastille Day celebrations in other countries. This comes from Wikipedia, Belgium, Canada, uh, the Czech Republic, Hungary, India, Ireland, New Zealand, South Africa, United Kingdom and the United States, mercy. United States, Baltimore, Boston, Cape Vincent, New York, Chicago, uh, Dallas, Dallas, Texas, Houston, Texas, Miami, all these different places all over our country celebrate this Bastille Day. Do you see how this can come together really quickly and manifest something very demonic? How the powers that be in the world today are, are really working almost in a disguise, or not almost in a disguise, they are in disguise. But you know, the fact that the simple fact that we have a, a Jesuit, an openly Jesuit Pope now, some of those disguises, they don't really need them anymore. Why is that? It's because the world is becoming more and more loving towards this group of people. 
Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Montgomery, Ohio, New Orleans, Orlando, Philadelphia, Oregon, California, Seattle, St. Louis, it's all over our country, all over. The people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress described by the prophet as the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, what was Jacob's trouble? What did he do? He deceived his brother. And what was the outcome of that? He had to wrestle with God, didn't he? He had to wrestle with Jesus, I believe. Thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. All faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Praise the Lord, Jeremiah 35 through 7, GC 616. So Jacob's trouble, we find it in Genesis 32, 24 through 30, represents the experience of God's people in the time of trouble. What does it represent? That night, Jacob was wrestling with this, this anguish. He was about to meet his brother Esau. He knew that he was out to get him. And so he was about to meet him the next day, go on this long journey. And he had, he, had, he had no army, but Esau did. He was afraid of that. But that was that the main thing that he was afraid of? Was he really, truly afraid of dying? Or what was he really afraid of? Because of the deception practiced to secure his father's blessing intended for Esau, Jacob had fled for his life. Alarmed by his brother's deadly threats, after remaining for many years in exile, he had set out at God's command to return with his wives and children, his flocks and herds, to his native country. On reaching the borders of the land, he, saw, he was filled with terror by the tidings of Esau's approach at the head of a band of warriors doubtless bent upon revenge. So Jacob's company, they were unarmed and defenseless, and it seemed like uh, he was going to be slaughtered, right? And added to the burden of anxiety and fear was added the, and to the burden of anxiety and fear was added the crushing weight of self-reproach. Of self-reproach. What is self-reproach? Yeah, you're disgusted with yourself. For it was his own sin that had brought this danger. His only hope was in the mercy of God. His only defense must be prayer. Yet he leaves nothing undone on his own part to atone for the wrong to his brother and to avert the threatened danger. So should the followers of Christ as they approach the time of trouble. We need to make every exertion to cleanse ourselves and, and free ourselves from any sin, place them all on the altar, place them all before Christ at His feet, get forgiveness for sin, plead with Him for that, so that, that we don't have to, to uh, fear this same destruction. He sent his family away, and the crisis in his life has become everything is it, is, is, has come, everything is at stake, in the darkness and solitude, he continues praying and humbling himself before God. This is when he was just struggling with this whole dilemma. Suddenly, a hand is laid upon his shoulder. He thinks that an enemy is seeking his life. And with all the energy of despair, he wrestles with his assailant. As the day begins to break, as the day begins to break, remember that. It's very important. The stranger puts forth his superhuman power at his touch, the strong man seems paralyzed, and he falls a helpless, weeping suppliant upon the neck of his mysterious antagonist. So Jacob knows now that it is the angel of the, co uh, of the covenant with whom he has been in conflict. Through disabled, though disabled, and suffering the keenest pain, he does not relinquish his purpose. So he's suffering dire pain because of being touched on this, uh, uh, from the... From the uh, from this uh, stranger in the night, and he's got this great pain in his leg, but the pain is not the problem. That's not what he's, what he's really wanting to be relieved from, you see. Long has he endured perplexity, remorse, and trouble for his sins. Now he must have the assurance that it is pardoned. That's what he's struggling for. That's what he wants to make sure of, that his sins are forgiven him. 
The divine visitant seems about to depart, but Jacob clings to him, pleading for a blessing. The angel urges, let me go, for the day breaketh. Again, remember that. But the, the patriarch exclaims, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. What confidence, what firmness and perseverance are here displayed. Had this been a boastful, presumptuous claim, Jacob would have been instantly destroyed. Wow. Instantly destroyed. If, he had been, if there had been any transgression, any impurity in his heart and his motives, he would have been destroyed in an instant. But his was the assurance of one who confesses his weakness and unworthiness, yet trusts the mercy of a covenant-keeping God. That's what we want. He had power over the angel and prevailed, Hosea 12, 4. So, did he really have power over the angel? No. God was just merciful to him, right? Putting up a good fight for him. But, what a, what a great and glorious sign of a merciful God that he was willing to go through that with him and wrestle with him so that he would be able to get the victory that he so desired and the uh, forgiveness that he so desired. He had fastened his trembling grasp upon the promises of God and the heart of, of infinite love could not turn away the sinner's plea. His name was changed from one which is a reminder of his sin to one that commemorated his victory. What does Jacob mean? Suppliant. He's a suppliant. He's a circumvents. He, he assails. Okay? That's what, uh, that's what his name actually means. And what did his name become? Israel, right? And the fact that Jacob had prevailed with God was an assurance that, the, that he would prevail with men. He no longer feared the, to encounter his brother's anger, for the Lord was his defense. GC 6.17 but you see what Satan does. He says, uh, Satan accuses J uh, Jacob before the angels of God, claiming the right to destroy him because of his sins. He had moved upon Esau to march against him, and during the patriarch's long night of wrestling, Satan endeavored to force upon him a sense of his guilt in order to discourage him and break his hold upon God. So right there, while this battle was going between, between God and Jacob, Satan was right there trying to tempt and discourage Satan. So when we feel discouraged about, I mean, tempt and discourage Jacob. So when we are struggling in life, we need to remember that that most likely is just Satan coming up against us, trying to discourage us and keep us from doing the right thing. Amen? Amen. Jacob was driven almost to despair, but he knew that without help from heaven, he must perish. He had sincerely repented of his great sin and he appealed to the mercy of God. He would not be turned from his purpose, but held fast the angel and urged his petition with earnest, agonizing cries until he prevailed. GC 6.18 So Satan has influenced Esau to march against Jacob, so he will stir up the wicked to destroy God's people in the time of trouble. That is what he's going to try to do. He's going to put all of his forces against us to discourage us. And as he accused Jacob, he will urge his accusations against the people of God. He numbers the world as his subjects. Satan believes that every single person in the world is his. They're his. They're his, his uh, conquered um, people and uh, that he can do whatever he wants to with us. But God says no, praise the Lord. But the little company who kept the commandments of God are resisting his supremacy. If he could blot them from the earth, his triumph would be complete. He sees that holy angels are guarding them, and he infers that their sins have been pardoned, but he does not know that their cases have been decided in the sanctuary. What is the name of this study here today, this chapter? The Time of Trouble. The time of trouble. What did we just discover? That when Michael stands up, it's over, the, all the cases have been decided, and then it's the time of trouble after that? I find this fascinating. Satan does not realize that our cases have already been decided. He still thinks that he can throw us off and that he can destroy us. That's awesome. 
that also gives way to, to see that Satan does not have the power that he presents himself to have. If he is not able to see that the work is done and that our cases are decided, he is completely, totally inferior. Praise God, I want to be on the side of the one who knows all, not the one who thinks he knows all. Amen? He has an accurate knowledge of the sins which he has tempted them to commit, and he presents these before God in the most aggregated, exaggerated light, representing this people to be just as deserving as himself of exclusion from the favor of God. He wants to include all of us in this misery loves company. Satan is working from that angle that all of us are deserving of death, which we are. But praise the Lord, Jesus Christ is standing in our place. He's standing for us. When he stands up, he's standing for us. He declares that the Lord cannot in justice forgive the sin, their sins and yet destroy him and his angels. He claims them as his prey and demands that they be given into his hands to be destroyed. He wants to have the control over all of our lives. As Satan accuses the people of God on account of their sins, the Lord permits him to try them to the utter, uttermost. Wow, that's not something I'm looking forward to. We better have a really good close connection with the Lord, amen? Their confidence in God, their faith and firmness will be severely tested. As they review the past, their hopes sink. Isn't that interesting? As we go over our past, as we reflect upon the life that we've led, our hopes sink. Why? Why is that? For in their whole lives, they can see little good. They are fully conscious of their weakness and unworthiness. Have you ever met those kind of people that seem to have it all figured out and have all the answers and um, seem to be what we would term kind of full of themselves. I've been that person. I pray that I'm not anymore. I, I have to lay that at the altar every day. But that is not the kind of spirit that we're going to have if we're in that number. You see that? That's not the kind of spirit that we're going to have. We are going to have a, a spirit that we understand and realize how weak we are, how impure we are, and how unworthy we are. But praise God, he sees something else in us because Jesus will be standing in our place. Satan endeavors to terrify them with the thought that their cases are hopeless, that the strain of their defilement will never be washed away. I'm sorry, the stain of their defilement will never be washed away. He hopes so to destroy their faith that they will yield to his temptations and turn from their allegiance to God. GC 6.18 Though God's people will be surrounded by enemies who are bent upon their destruction, yet the anguish which they suffer is not a dread of persecution for the truth's sake. They fear that every sin has not been repented of. You see how that is? This is very similar to what Jacob's trouble is all about, right? Remember? It didn't, he didn't care so much about the pain that he was in. He didn't care so much about the, the fact that he was going to be facing his brother. His main concern was that he was not fully forgiven. He wanted that forgiveness. And so it will be with us, if we're accounted among that number, we want to be, we're going to be, our struggle, our great time of trouble is going to be that we are struggling with, and, and, and the conflict in our mind is going to be, have we repented of every sin? Is my name still on the book in heaven? And that, through some fault in themselves, they will fail to realize the fulfillment of the Savior's promise. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world, Revelation 3.10. He's going to keep us. We need to rely on Him and count on His promises. If they could have the assurance of pardon, they would not shrink from torture or death. See, it doesn't matter. The torture and the death, that's not the important thing. But should they prove unworthy and lose their lives because of their own defects of character, then God's holy name would be reproached. 
They afflict their souls before God, pointing to their past repentance of their many sins and pleading the Savior's promise. Let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. Isaiah 27, 5. Their faith does not fail because their prayers are not immediately answered. You know, we like to have our prayers. We like to see it come to fruition right, right away. But the true believers of God, those, those ones that are sealed, they're not going to lose their faith just because the prayers are not immediately answered. Though suffering the keenest anxiety, terror and, terror, and distress, they do not cease their intercessions. They laid hold of the strength of God as Jacob laid hold of the angel. You see, we have that struggle and we want to cling to God and His promises. That's why we need to be studying and reading the Word of God. I will not let, let thee go except thou bless me. Had not Jacob previously repented of his sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud, God would not have heard his prayer and mercifully preserved his life. So in the time of trouble, if the people of God had unconfessed sins to appear before them while tortured with fear and anguish, they would be overwhelmed, despair would cut off their faith, and they could not have confidence to plead with God for deliverance. But while they have a deep sense of their unworthiness, they have no concealed wrongs to reveal. Their sins have gone beforehand to the judgment and have been blotted out, and they cannot bring them to remembrance. That's, that's what I really like right there, that last part. They cannot bring them to remembrance. You know, when I reflect upon my life and the, some of the things that I've done, uh, I shudder. And it's going to be so wonderful to get to that point when those things are erased and I don't have to reflect upon them anymore. Anybody else feel that way? Am I the only one? Amen. 620, GC 620. Satan leads many to believe that God will overlook their unfaithfulness in the minor affairs of life. Boy, does he ever. But the Lord shows in his dealings with Jacob that he will in no wise sanction or tolerate evil of any kind. He's not going to do it. Clearly, we see that in that example. The more exalted their profession and the more honorable the position which they hold, the more grievous is their course in the sight of God. Who am I talking about here? <clears throat> These ones that uh, <clears throat> remain upon the books of heaven unconfessed and unforgiven will be overcome by Satan. The ones that are overcome by Satan, the more exalted their profession and the more honorable the position in which they hold, the more grievous is their course in the sight of God and the more sure the triumph of their great adversary. So when we see leaders getting away with sins just incomprehensible, they're going to have a retribution. It's going to have its consequences much more so than those who are just found to be unjust. Those who delay in preparation for the day of God cannot obtain it in the time of trouble or at any subsequent time. So once the time of trouble comes, that's it. There's no more forgiveness of sin. The case of all such is hopeless, GC 620. The professed Christians who come up to that last fearful conflict unprepared will in their despair confess their sins in words of burning anguish. While the wicked exalt over their distress, these confessions are of the same character as was that of Esau or of Judas. Those who make them lament the result of transgression so they don't like the punishment, but they're still guilty. The guilt, the guilt is still there. They don't, they, don't, they don't want to truly have forgiveness and be completely remorseful of their sins so that they can receive the blessing of the Lord. They just want that penalty to be removed, right? They feel no true contrition, no abhorrence of evil. They acknowledge their sin through fear of punishment, but like Pharaoh of old, they would return to their defiance of heaven should the judgments be removed. So it doesn't matter how much they um, claim to be in distress and, and, and confessing of their sins, they're still going to go right back to their old ways. Jacob's history is also an assurance that God will not cast off those who have been deceived and tempted and betrayed into sin. 
but who have returned unto him with true repentance. That's what we must do. We must return to God with true repentance. While Satan seeks to destroy this class, God will send his angels to comfort and protect them in the time of peril. So the Holy Spirit, it will be removed from this world, but we will still be guarded by angels. Isn't that wonderful to know? The Lord's eyes upon his people and his ear listens to their cries. God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. But it is needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire. Their, their earthliness must be consumed. Our earthliness must, the worldliness that is within us, it has to be burned off. It has to be consumed. That the image of what? The image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. We must have that perfect image of Christ in order to be saved. GC 621. The seasons of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger. A faith that will not faint through severe, though severely tried. Are we ready for that? Are we, are we, do we have that kind of a faith that's going to endure weariness, delay, and hunger? Hunger's tough. It's, it, it, it's not an easy thing to fast. You all fast? Between supper and breakfast? Hmm. I guess that's why they call it break fast in the morning. Yeah. No, I mean like fast. <laughs> like really fast for a day or days. We need to be doing these things. That prepares us to be able to push aside that temptation to have, we must have food or we're just going to die right now. I mean, I've, I've heard these kind of testimonies from people. You know, one, uh, you know, the health message, part of the health message is that we should not eat late before we go to bed. And I remember we were at a, a church and there was a little skinny little woman um, and, and very frail. And she said, oh, I, oh no, I, have to, I cannot go to bed hungry on an empty stomach. I have to eat before I go to bed. And in talking with her, bless her heart, I mean, I'm not, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not passing out judgment on her, but the interesting thing was she was extremely unhealthy. She was dying. And I can't help but think, you know, maybe Ellen White's right. Fasting is one of the, one of the best things to reverse disease. Just saying. Those who are unwilling to deny self, to agonize before God, to pray long and earnestly for His blessing will not obtain it. It's not going to happen. We must pray long and earnestly, agonize with the Lord, as Jacob did. Now, not in the time of trouble. I mean, in the time of trouble, yes, true, but now we need to be doing that. We, don't, we, we can't just expect that to manifest once we... Go, through, go into the time of trouble. We must be doing that now. Those who ex exercise but little faith now are in the greatest danger of falling under the power of satanic delusions and the decree to compel the conscience. And even if they endure the test, they will be plunged into deeper distress and anguish in the time of trouble because they have never made it a habit to trust in God. We must make it a habit now to trust in God. And what, and what does um, Revelation 14 and verse 12 say? Yes. And? And the what? They have the faith of Jesus. They keep the commandments of God, and they have the faith of Jesus. We need to have that faith, that faith of Jesus. The lesson of faith which they have neglected, they will be forced to learn under a terrible pressure of discouragement. We don't want to, I mean, we don't want to put it off to the last minute, right? We need to be preparing now. Make sure that we're completely ready, because you never, you never know when it's going to come and if we're not persevering, if we're not wrestling with God now, we may not have an opportunity to later. 
We should now acquaint ourselves with God by proving His promises. Angels record every prayer that is earnest and sincere. Every prayer. That's wonderful. We should rather dispense with selfish gratifications than neglect communion with God. How, how, how often do we do that? How often do we neglect the selfish gratification so that we can commune with God? We need to be doing it now. The deepest poverty, the greatest self-denial with his approval is better than riches, honors, ease, and friendship without. It's better, friends. It's better. It's better than the riches and the honors and the ease. We must take time to pray. If we allow our minds to be absorbed by worldly interests, the Lord may give us the time by, remo by removing from us our idols of gold, of houses, or of fertile lands. Wow. He may remove them from us. I say praise God. If that's what it takes for me to obtain salvation, remove whatever. Lord, I give you permission. And I pray that is our prayer, all of us, for all of us, that uh, we are willing to give up anything of this world to make sure that we are counted worthy. The young would not be seduced into sin if they would refuse to enter any path save that upon which they could ask God's blessing. Do you hear that? The young would not be seduced into sin if they would refuse to enter any path save that upon which they could ask God's blessing. If we can't ask God's blessing upon it, we shouldn't be doing it. That's the bottom line. The time of trouble, such as never was, is soon to open upon us, and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess and which many are too indolent to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. This is so true. Listen to this. This is, this is very poignant. But this is not true of the crisis before us. So usually, usually when we perceive danger or trouble, you know, you ever been through that time? Man, I thought that was going to just be a terrible situation, but it ended up turning out okay. You know, it was kind of like the, the whole truck situation when I was coming home the other day. I was fearful that it was going to be really bad. I didn't know how, what the outcome was going to be, but it turned out to not be so bad. It's going to be the same. It's not going to be that way when we come down to the time of trouble. It's not. It's not true on this crisis because we can't even imagine. Look at this. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. In that time of trial, every soul must stand for himself before God. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in the land, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. They deliver their own souls by their righteousness. We must have our own righteousness. We can't count on anyone else's. GC 622. Now, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Now, while, there, while there's still time. Now we need to be seeking perfection in Christ. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. Perfect in Christ. The Apostle John in vision heard a loud voice in heaven exclaiming, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Revelation 12:12. 12, 12. Fearful are the scenes which call forth this exclamation from the heavenly voice. The wrath of Satan increases as his time grows short and his work of deceit and destruction will reach its culmination in the time of trouble. When is it going to reach its culmination? Its highest point? Its greatest amount of fierce and, and destruction? It's the time of trouble. Fearful sights of supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens. In token of the power of miracle-working demons, the spirits of devils will go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to fasten them in deception and urge them on to unite with Satan in his last struggle against the government of heaven. By these agencies, rulers and subjects will be alike deceived. Persons will arise pretending to be Christ himself. Ever seen any, heard of any doing that? 
and claiming the title and worship which belong to the world's Redeemer, they will perform wonderful miracles of healing and will profess to have revelations from heaven contradicting the testimony of the Scriptures, GC 624. Well, here's a few that have done this. <clears throat> um, Apollo Quibaloy, um, he is, let me just look at this here. He is founder and leader of the Kingdom of Jesus. He has some six million devoted followers, claims to be Christ. Well, that's one. Here's another one, Oscar Ramiro Ortega Hernandez. And uh, in 2011, this supposed Christ tried to kill Obama, President Obama. But um, he took several shots, nine shots at the White House and didn't hit anybody. But um, anyway, he claims to be Christ. Uh, Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda. This one is an interesting one here. Uh, he says that he is, in fact, the Messiah and that he is also the Antichrist all in one. He is tattooed 666, yeah, his arm, tattooed on his arm. And this one, this, this guy's, uh, I heard about him on the news. He's um, or on media somewhere. I don't remember exactly where, but he has a huge following as well. Uh, Sergey Torop, I'm not going to try to pronounce his, first, his middle name, as uh, Jesus Christ he claims to be. And uh, An Sang Hong, uh, World uh, Mission Society, has a lot of followers as well. And, you know, interestingly enough, you know, we can, we, we can say that, well, it's not going to bother us, we're Seventh-day Adventists, but this man was a prominent member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church at one point. And then this man here, Wayne Bent, he is of the Lord Our Righteousness cult, and... Um, he claims to be Christ as well, and he was a pastor of the Seventh Day Adventist of a Seventh Day Adventist church at one point, and he has a great following. But he's in prison since 2008. He's been in prison serving a a um, he may be out now because it says a 10 year sentence for molesting a 16 year old girl. So um, he is definitely not going to be Christ. But we see these people claiming to be Christ all the time, don't they? And, of course, the ultimate one is the Pope himself. He is the vicar of Christ. He claims to be. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. So this is going to be the big one. This is going to be. When does it happen? The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness. Dazzling bright. He's not going to come with a pitchfork all red with horns and a tail. Okay? It's going to be dazzling brightness. And look at that. He's, he's going to be in different parts of the earth. Hmm. Resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation uh, 1, 13-15, the glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. All of those other ones that I put up there, they're not going to hold a candle to this one. He is going to have a glory about him that uh, we can't imagine. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. So he's, he's completely embodying what we would perceive and what the religious powers of the world would perceive as Christ himself. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the disease, the diseases of the people. And then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed what? The Sabbath to Sunday. So up until this point, is he doing everything pretty much okay according to the Word of God? He has. But it's one big major lie right there that can clue us all in. But there's more than that. We'll get to it. 
And he commands all hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. Have you heard about this Holy Spirit movement in churches? Some churches, they won't even allow you to have Bibles in them. You just are moved and led by the Holy Spirit completely. But the best way to be led by the Holy Spirit is through God's Word. Amen? You see how slight the deception can be? This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. This one here, when he claims that he has changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, and he walks upon this earth, it is, this is the strong, overmastering delusion. It's going to be huge. Like the Samaritans who were deceived by Simon Magus, the multitudes from the least to the greatest give heed to these sorceries, saying, This is the great power of God. Acts 8.10 GC 6.24. Praise the Lord, though. The true people of God will not be misled. Amen. I want to be in that number. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the Scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast and his image, the very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingling wrath shall be poured out. And what is the beast in his image? Roman Catholicism and Sunday. And furthermore, Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's advent. The Savior, Savior has warned his people against deception upon this point. Has he warned us? Yes, he has. There's, 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 the truth is in the Word of God, and if we will study the Word of God, we will know. It's just like in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. The ones that, that take, took heed of what Christ had warned them about, about that destruction, they were not slain. They were not killed. Not one Christian died in that slaughter. And has clearly foretold the manner of his second coming. There shall arise false Christ and false prophets. We're seeing that all the time. And shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. So what was wrong with uh, Satan's impersonation of Christ? What did he do? He comes down to this earth, doesn't he? And he's seen here and there, right? For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 24 through 27 and, and onward. This coming, there is no possibility of counterfeiting. It will be universally known, witnessed by the whole world. Everyone will see it. Everyone. It's not going to be here and there, secret chambers, blah, blah, blah. It's not going to be any of that. Everybody is going to see it. His feet will not touch the earth. Remember that. That's very important. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We will rise up off of this earth and meet Him in the air. He is not going to be coming down to this earth and walking this earth like He did the first time. His second advent, we are going to come up to Him to meet Him. Remember, it's very, very important. That is, the, that is going to be the, the greatest point of deception coming into all of this. Because people are going to exclaim, oh, wow, he's, 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 there he is, he's over here, he's got this glory, you know, all this majesty and all this power, he's forgiving people sins, he's healing their sicknesses and diseases, he's doing mighty and wonderful wonders. Don't be deceived. We will not see Christ walking on the earth. We will go up to meet him. Only those who have, diligent, uh, have been diligent students of the Scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusions that takes the world captive. Cling to the Bible and the Bible only. Satan will, if possible, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. Don't let Satan steal away your salvation. Don't let him do it. Study the Word. <clears throat> 
as the decree is issued by various rulers of Christendom against commandment keeping keepers, shall withdraw the protection of government and abandon them to those who des desire their destruction. So while the Holy Spirit is being withdrawn, the protection from our governments will be withdrawn from us. Do you see how that goes? So basically, Satan will be pulling away his protection from us while God is pulling away his protection from them. Interesting. <clears throat> The people of God will flee from the cities and villages and, and associate together in companies dwelling in the most desolate and solitary places. Many will find refuge in the strongholds of the mountains. That's what we need to be preparing for. The beloved of God pass weary days, bound in chains, shut in by prison bars, sentenced to be slain, some apparently left to die of starvation in dark and loathsome dungeons, no human ear is open to hear their moans. No human hand is ready to lend them help. But don't get despair. There's good news. Will the Lord forget his people in this trying hour? Well, did he forget Noah, the faithful Noah, Lot, Joseph, Elijah, Jeremiah, the three worthies in the fiery furnace, Daniel in the lion's den? No, he didn't. He didn't forget any of them. And he won't forget us either. Praise the Lord. Though the armies may thrust them into prison, yet dungeon walls cannot cut off the communication between their souls and Christ. We don't have to worry about a cell phone reception, reception here. We're not going to have to worry about cell phone tower reception with God. Our communication with Him will always be there. We never have to worry about that. We know that He can hear us, and He sees us, and He is watching, and He is keeping keeping. Uh, account of everything that is happening and he is leading us through his angels and keeping us safe it's a beautiful promise the prison will be as a palace for the rich and faith dwell there the rich in faith dwell there the prison will be a palace I love how that's worded so no matter where we are even if we're in a dungeon or a pit or a, a prison or a jail whatever it is The rich dwell there, so it's as a palace. Right? Isn't that neat? And the gloomy walls will be lightened up with the heavenly light as when Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises at midnight in the Philippian dungeon. Doesn't matter where we are, God will be there with us. GC 627. God's judgment will be visited upon those who are seeking to oppress and destroy his people. His long forbearance with the wicked emboldens men in transgression, but their punishment is nonetheless certain and terrible because it is long delayed. You know, so, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier. Why is it that these evil people can, they just seem to prosper, you know? No matter how, it almost is like, I've actually heard people say this, you know, I chose to go that route because I looked at the wicked the ones that were doing the evil, and they were prospering, and I wasn't. So switching sides to follow them because they're prospering. They're doing well. We need to be careful when we, even within church circles, people claiming that the Lord is blessing them with all this and that, and they have all these riches and so forth. I'm not saying that he doesn't ever bless people that way. Obviously, he did Job and others and, and, and Joseph and others. But what I'm saying is we need to be really careful when we even look at those people because how are they living their life? We can't see behind closed doors. We don't know. We need to make sure that we are not looking to other men and women, that we are only looking to Jesus. And it doesn't matter if we're, we're in a pover poverty or impoverished lifestyle or not. As long as we are in God's will, in His way, we're, we're good. We're royalty. We're heirs to the kingdom. Amen? His long forbearance with the wicked emboldens men in transgression, but their punishment is nonetheless certain and terrible because it is long delayed. The Lord shall rise up as Mount Perizim. 
He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. What is his strange act? The extinguishing of life of the wicked. That is a very strange act for God, isn't it? To our merciful God, the act of punishment is a strange act. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Now, there's people out there, there's a big movement even among Seventh-day Adventists that God does not punish. That's a bold-faced lie. That is a deception. God does punish. He does. The Lord is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, GC 627. Yet He will by no means clear the guilty. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. The nation with which He bears long and which He will not smite until it has fulfilled up the measure of its iniquity in God's account will finally drink the cup of wrath mixed with mercy, GC 627. So what would be that um, nation which bears long and doesn't seem to be hurt by their iniquity? I know one for sure is Rome, right? When Christ ceases His intercession in the sanctuary, the unmingled wrath threatened against those who worship the beast and His image and receive His mark in Revelation 14, 9 and 10 will be poured out. Have no mistake about it. It will happen. There fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image, the sea became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea, and the rivers and fountains of waters became blood. You see 627. It's going to happen. They will receive their due punishment. Terrible as these inflictions are, God's justice stands fully vindicated. Fully vindicated. God's justice is fully vindicated always. The angel of God declares, Thou art righteous, O Lord, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy of that blood, is what he's saying. Revelation 16, 2 through 6. In like manner, Christ declared the Jews of his time guilty of all the blood of holy men which had been shed since the days of Abel. Isn't that interesting? These men were guilty of all the blood that had been shed since the days of Abel. In the plague that follows, power is given to the sun to scorch men with fire. The, the very object in which all of these people worship, sun day, sun worship, sun god worship. You know, the Pope wears this Dagon, uh, Dagon you know, uh, hat, which is a symbol of the fish, fish god and sun worship. It's going to scorch them. The very God that they love and adore is going to uh, scorch them with fire. Great heat. How do the beast groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. You know, we're seeing some of this today. There's a lot of uh, famines in our world today. Uh, we just saw that um, Australia is really struggling with a bad uh, case of... Uh, drought and their flocks i mean you should see the pictures they're the cows the sheep they're all emaciated they're dying left and right it's terrible but we're seeing these types of uh, pestilences upon the earth right now these plagues are not universal though the the seven last plagues are not going to be universal then have or the inhabitants of the earth would be wholly cut off Yet they will be the most awful scourges that have ever been known to the mortals. All the judgments upon men prior to the close of probation have been mingled with mercy. The pleading blood of Christ has, shed, has shielded the sinner from receiving the full measure of his guilt. But in the final judgment, wrath is poured out unmixed with mercy. No more mercy. God's wrath is going to be pulled out, poured out full strength. I don't want to be a recipient of that. In that day, multitudes will desire the shelter of God's mercy, which they have so long despised. They've been pushing it away for so long, but um, now they can't have it. They should have taken 
uh, taken advantage of it when they could have. <coughs> The people of God will not be free from suffering, but while persecuted and distressed, while they endure privation and suffer for want of food, they will not be left to perish. That God who cared, that God who cared for Elijah will not pass by one of his self-sacrificing children. He who numbers the hairs of their head will care for them, and in time of famine they shall be satisfied. Praise the Lord. That's a great promise. While the wicked are dying from hunger and pestilence, angels will shield the righteous and supply their wants. To him that walketh righteously is the promise, bread shall be given, thee, given him, his water shall be sure. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Isaiah 33, 15, 16, 41, and 17 and GC 629. The Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Psalms 121, 5 through 7. Yet to human sight it will appear that the people of God must soon seal their testimony with, with their blood as did the martyrs before them. So it'll appear by the world's standard, it'll appear from these evil, wicked people of the world that soon we are all going to perish, those who are, are sealed in the, in the time of trouble. Their countenances express their internal struggle, paleness sits upon every face, yet the, they cease not their earnest intercession. They continue to plead with the Lord. They do not stop even though they may, they may look as though they're about to perish, they never stop crying out to the Lord. Could men see with heavenly vision, they would behold com companies of angels that excel in strength, stationed about those who have kept the word of Christ's patience. With sympathizing tenderness, angels have witnessed their distress and have heard their, their prayers. They are waiting the word of their commander to snatch them from their peril but they must wait yet a little longer. And why? The people of God must drink of the cup and be baptized with the baptism. The very delay, so painful to them, is the best answer to their petitions. So, remember when um, James and John came to Christ, and oh, actually they got their mother, uh, Salome, to go to Christ and, and asked Jesus if, if her sons could be one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus asked them a very important question. He said, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with? They said, we are able. They had no idea what they were committing to, did they? But you see how, how we can see the parallels between what Christ went through and what we are going to have to go through. You see that? As they endeavor to wait trustingly for the Lord to work, they are led to exercise faith, hope, and patience, which have been too little exercised during their, their religious experience. So while we're going through this period of the time of trouble, this wrestling with God as Jacob did, we are going to um, actually be ridding ourselves completely of the dross of the worldliness that is within us. It's for our own good. We must have that experience in order to be uh, able to be able to be transported into heaven. The end will come more quickly than men expect. It's going to happen a lot faster than we even think. The wheat will be gathered and bound in sheaves for the garner of God. The tares will be bound as faggots for the fires of destruction, GC 630. The heavenly sentinels, faithful to their trust, continue their watch. Though a general decree has fixed the time when commandment keepers may be put to death, their enemies will in some cases anticipate the decree, and before the time specified will endeavor to take their lives. So there's going to be a death decree. We're going to have a death decree placed upon us, and it's going to be a, a, for a certain time, but some of those evil, wicked men are going to try to put us to death beforehand. And what happens? But none can pass the mighty guardian stationed about every faithful soul. 
Some are assailed in their flight from the cities and villages, but the swords raised against them break and fall powerless as a straw. I can't wait to see these things. I mean, it's going to be a dreadful time. And I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say I can't wait. But it's going to be interesting for these, in these times when they are going to raise up ammunition against us, but it's going to fall and break and, and self-destruct right before us. What an interesting time. I mean, I'm sure we're not going to really grasp, you know, fully what is, what is happening at that time. I don't know what exactly our mental condition is going to be like, but it's going to be fascinating, I think, to see these things manifest. In the form of men, angels are often in the assemblies of the righteous, and they visit the assemblies of the wicked. As they went to Sodom to make a record of their deeds to determine whether they have passed the boundary of God's forbearance, the Lord delights in mercy, and for the sake of a few who really serve Him, He restrains the calamities and prolongs the tranquility of multitudes. Little do sinners, I love this now, you know, make special note of this, mark it in your books. Little do sinners against God realize that they are indebted for their own lives to the faithful few whom they delight to ridicule and oppress. So because of a few, the forbearance of God is, is, is sustained and they are not punished because a few people are good among them. But yet the whole time, they're ridiculing and jesting and persecuting. Isn't that interesting? They don't realize that the very thing that they're fighting against is the very thing that is preserving their lives. GC 631. Again, in the council hall and the court of justice, these heavenly messengers have shown an intimate acquaintance with the human history. They have proved themselves better able to plead for plead the cause of the oppressed than were their ablest and most eloquent defenders. They have defeated purposes and arrested evils that would have greatly retarded the work of God and would have caused great suffering to His people. In the hour of peril and distress, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him and delivereth them. Psalms 34, 7. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. With earnest longing, God's people await the tokens of their coming king. As the watchmen are accosted, what of the, of the night? The answer is given unfa unfalteringly. The morning cometh and also the night. Isaiah 21, 11, and 12. The light is gleaming upon the clouds above. The mountaintops soon there will be a revealing of His glory. The sun of righteousness is about to shine forth. The morning and the night are both at hand. The opening of endless day to the, the righteous. The settling down of eternal night to the wicked. You see, when Jacob was wrestling with the angel, the angel said, let me go for the, for the day cometh, right? It was nighttime, but the day was coming. It's going to be the same for us. We're going to see that the day is coming. And we, 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 we just know that we are going to be delivered very soon. And the morning and the night are both at hand, but the opening of endless day to the righteous is right upon the horizon. The settling down of eternal night to the wicked. It's going to be almost over. Even though we're wrestling, it will almost be over once we start seeing the, the light coming. As the wrestling ones urge their petition before God, the veil separating them from the unseen seems almost withdrawn. The heavens glow with the drawing of eternal day. And like the melody of angel songs, the words fall upon the ear. Stand fast to your allegiance. Help is coming. Christ, the almighty victor, holds out to his weary soldiers a crown of immortal glory. And his voice comes from the, the gates ajar. Lo, I am with you. Be not afraid. I am acquainted with all your sorrows. I have borne your griefs. You are not warring against untried enemies. I have fought the battle in your behalf, and in my name you are more than conquerors. Praise the Lord for that. The precious Savior will send His help just when it's needed the most. That's when it's going to come, just when it's needed. The way to heaven is consecrated by His footprints. Every thorn that wounds our feet has wounded His. Every cross that we are called to bear, He has borne before us. The Lord permits conflicts 
To prepare the soul for peace, the time of trouble is a fearful ordeal for God's people. But it is the time for every true believer to look up and by faith he may see the bow of promise, the bow of promise encircling him. We just need to look up, look to God, and we will see the bow of promise. And what was that bow of promise? It was the rainbow, right? Do you see 633? The redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I, even I, am he that comforteth you, and I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand. Even the, the dregs of the cup of my fury, thou shalt no more drink it again, but I will put it into the hand of them that afflict thee. So the, 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 the dreadful cup is going to be put into the hands of the ones that are trying to destroy us. The eye of God looking down the ages was fixed upon the crisis which his people are to meet when earthly power shall be arrayed against them. If the blood of Christ's faithful witnesses were shed at this time, it would not, like the blood of the martyrs, be as seed sown to yield a harvest for God. So in other words, when we are in those, the, the time of trouble and those final weeks or days, however long it is, we will not die. We will not perish. Why? Because the blood will not produce any kind of a harvest. It will be of no good to, to shed. And look at this. If the righteous were now left to fall a prey to their enemies, it would be a triumph for the prince of darkness. See? So we're not going to die once we get in, once probation is ended and we are sealed and we go into the time of trouble. We're not going to die. God is going to preserve us. Praise the Lord. That's wonderful because our blood won't be seed. That's, all, that's, that's the, the main reason why martyrs are killed today is to uh, be seed. Says the psalmist, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. Psalms 27, 5. Christ has spoken. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Isaiah 26, 20, and 21. Glorious will be the deliverance of those who have, have patiently waited for his coming and whose names are written in the book of life. We want to make sure that we are patiently waiting for his coming and that our names remain on the books of life in heaven. The Lamb's book of life, Revelation 21, 27. We want to make sure that we remain on that, on those books, our names and that we are accounted worthy to uh, receive the inheritance of everlasting life with our dear Savior, Jesus Christ.